It's Halloween night, and the downtown streets are almost silent, except for the ragged breath of a few dead leaves, the wind dragging their bodies across the cement into their final resting place. You think about how strange it is on this night, on this millennial Christmas, that there are no clowns stabbing at the air with plastic butcher knives, no last-minute vampires chewing on plastic fangs, sucking back spit audibly, and no Disney princesses or Marvel movie heroes sulking at their parents' sides. The porch lights are all out this year. It seems once and for all. No one wants poisoned candy, and no one wants to be wrongfully accused of poisoning candy. So you keep walking, hear the techno boom of the Halloween nightlife, smoke machines carrying the smell of chlorine and stale beer onto the sidewalks. You know that inside, breath fogs the 80s glasses of a hundred shirtless Jeffrey Dahmers. You know that every single person inside every single one of these clubs is dressed like Jeffrey Dahmer. But this Halloween, You don't want to black out and then wake up beside yet another Jeffrey Dahmer. As you approach the last corner of the main drag, all but ready to return home, ready to declare that Halloween just isn't what it used to be, you see something. One solemn neon sign, buzzing, flashing, on and off. You can barely even tell if this bar is open at all. The windows are dark, spiderwebbed, plastic skeleton lined and fogged, but you can still make out rows of people seated, murmuring quietly. You open the door and step onto a plastic mat, and you hear it that same scream that has been greeting you since the early 1990s. And then, it dawns on you. This isn't a regular Halloween party. No, this is something much more frightening, much more ghoulish, much, much more brutal. This is an open mic. Just kidding. We love open mics here. And if you don't like open mics, that's totally normal. And we'll see you next time for a normal episode of American Hysteria. If you do like open mics, then boy, do we have a show for you. And you don't even have to go to a weird bar or coffee shop. You get to enjoy this from the comfort of your own coffin. I mean, home. Tonight's show includes our own team as well as friends of the podcast, and we're sharing poems, stories, and nonfiction. And if you stick around until the end, we're even sharing a song together. Featuring the work of Sarah Marshall of You're Wrong About and her co-host of You Are Good, Alex Steed, our resident voice actor and Guide to the Unknown podcast host Will Rogers, host of This Ends at Prom, BJ Colangelo, and American Hysteria team members Miranda Zickler, Riley Swedelius-Smith, and me. So tonight I'll be your ghost, I mean host, and as is customary since I have the microphone, I'm going to read you the first of a little series of horror movie poems that I wrote some years ago that I'm going to share with you throughout the night. Now listen, these aren't funny poems, they're not limericks, they're not goofy, in fact they are dead serious, and now you have to listen to the creepiest thing of all a podcaster's vulnerability. 
This first poem is about the folly of believing and the pain of losing belief. It's called The Blair Witch Project. I was 11, and I believed the footage was real, like the commercial said. Suburban churchless children build altars under things like that. I tied sticks into ominous figures, carefully with long blades of grass. I hung them outside people's tents, over their porches, stood them up on their windshields. Because the students had disappeared and their footage had been found buried beneath a colonial wall, you could see the dead children's handprints rumble like a plague across the nylon tent. You could see them covering the abandoned house where lost Josh was screaming and screaming from. And I know now that Josh is fine. He's better than fine. He isn't real. But still, there had been no script. The actors had found scraps of the day's plot in milk crates left by the crew at different spots in the woods. The directors made sounds in the night, took their things, tied sticks into figures, piled rocks. The crew's children running gleefully through the abandoned house, leaving the handprints of the dead children in this new fairy tale their parents had written. The actors didn't know what was real, and because of that, I still go on believing, because they might have, for a moment in the cold, crying into the camera, apologizing to every mother on earth for marching toward the dark things with a camera, thinking they could capture them, thinking they could laugh, believing they could not believe. Up next, we have our resident voice actor, who you know and love as so many beloved and hated American Hysteria characters, Mr. Will Rogers, also the co-host of the hilarious and spooky podcast, Guide to the Unknown. Will's also the writer of an amazing fictional podcast called Blackwood that you must check out. So come on up, Will Rogers. Chelsea. I received a letter recently, and I think it might actually be for you. It reads, To one of my favorites. Long-time listener, first-time writer, I want to tell you a story. Call it a hypothetical. Week after week, thousands of people wake up and immediately grab their phones, hoping to find a new episode of a podcast. After eagerly hitting play, the listeners listen while the host hosts. For many, the show is a bright spot in their otherwise exhausting lives. The host isn't merely reciting a story into a void. They're serving a very important role as a passive companion. A voice to make the mundane more tolerable. Laundry, dishes... Driving to work. Lots of listeners even say they turn the show on to fall asleep at night. And not because it's boring, no. They tend to say it's comforting. The host is like a friend to them. A really good friend who can be with you at the press of a button. The best service the host provides is an escape. In my favorite ones, they talk about anything and everything worth fearing. Monsters, legends, hysterias. The host debunks it all. They point a flashlight into the dark corner and show the listeners that there isn't really anything to be afraid of at all. Here's a horror story, and here's why you're actually safe from it. But one morning I woke up and realized what they've actually been doing. All these years, my friend had been removing magic from the world. It was never an escape. You've been building a trap. They say ignorance is bliss. 
Why would you deprive us of bliss? The constant debunking. Creepy clowns are just a movie promotion. Hitchhikers are typically victims, not killers. Your Halloween candy is perfectly safe to eat. Well, what if someone changed all that? Not just any someone. Me. It was as if true inspiration struck me from out of the blue. Every week is just an endless loop, you know? You shower just so you can get dirty again and need to take another shower. Why bother? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. My mother calls around seven. Yes, Mom. I'm fine, Mom. Eight hours of sleep. Eight hours of work. Eight hours of planning. Day after day after repetitive, monotonous day. But now, it's worth it. I've been counting down the days. Poof. Like magic, just around Halloween, my friend is releasing another show. An entire Halloween special, even. You know, at the store, no one batted an eye as I heaved a colorful suit onto the counter. But soon, they'll know all about it. Instead of driving home, I decided to hitch a ride back to my place. It didn't take long for someone to pull over. The driver said they don't normally pick people up off the side of the road. Oh, it was a first for both of us. Now, unfortunately, halfway home I had to get out and walk. I'm sure someone will pull over and find him, but I really needed to be at the house before the sun set. Kids are coming to trick-or-treat tonight, and I've got plenty of good Stuff to hand out before I take to the streets and backyards. Above all, I want to thank you for so many years of shows. They were full of great tips. Happy Halloween, a listener. P.S. The ones that don't contain razor blades are poisoned. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm pretty sure that letter is uh, for you. Thanks, Will. I've been worried about receiving a letter like that since starting this podcast. So thank you for realizing that fear for me. It's poem time again. And this next one is about realizing the limits of your empathy. It's called The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I once dreamed about Leatherface. I was on the ground, looking up at him, hands in front of my face, as if a flower in the barrel of a gun does anything at all. Held over his head, the teeth of the chainsaw, a magic blur, his big soft body beneath it, a rubber apron that almost made him a mother his face behind another face, behind another and another. I could see his eyes, slick and shining, under all the other faces, and I looked at them. I looked and looked and didn't blink. I saw something in there, a soft thing peeking out from a hole. And he sat down and he cried the chainsaw still running beside him, moving its jagged circle. I held his big hand in my lap like a gun, looking at it, turning it over in both of mine, thinking about all it can do and all it can't, thinking about all I can do and all I can't. Next up, we have horror film journalist, filmmaker, and host of one of our favorite podcasts, This Ends at Prom. Scream Queen herself, BJ Colangelo, is going to share a little nonfiction with us about the science of fear. Please welcome BJ. Fear may be universal, but the things that scare us are not. 
Part of the success and longevity of the horror genre is rooted in the fact that there is always going to be something for everyone. For some, the creeping dread of slow burn will always reign supreme, but for others, a jump scare will spark the uncontrolled visceral reaction. Scare staples like jump scares in host and audition, grotesque movement like the ring and terrified, or sudden changes to the scenery, Z, the Exorcist 3, all follow a similar science and psychology in order to manipulate the audience to experience fear. But as any Twitter thread about new horror movie will tell you, not all of us are susceptible to the same triggers, and not all of us respond to fear in the same way. Movie scares are typically crafted with some combination of sound and visual stimuli, which make them effective because they trigger a very primal instinct deep in our amygdala, the part of our brain that manages our fear and emotional responses, hormone secretions, arousal, and memory. Think about how you respond when you are scared or feel threatened. Typically, if we're experiencing emotions like aggression, sadness, or fear, our amygdala automatically activates our fight, flight, freeze, and fawn responses by sending out stress hormones, like adrenaline and cortisol, to help us prepare to deal with whatever situation is at hand. From an evolutionary standpoint, early humans were under the constant threat of being killed or maimed by predatory animals or other tribes, so the fight, flight, freeze responses were developed as a means of survival. Those automatic responses to danger allow us to react quickly, without thinking, but the ways in which we respond vary from person to person. Someone whose instinct is fight is going to respond immediately in the offensive, ready to take down whatever danger is coming their way. Those who respond with flight, like yours truly, have the instinct to get as far away from the problem as humanly possible. In both of those instances, our bodies go through an immediate and dramatic change. Our heart rate increases, adrenaline production increases, our pain perception drops, we breathe heavier to produce more oxygen, our peripheral vision increases, and our blood even thickens. Seriously, we're preparing for injury, and our hearing sharpens, all to help us deal with a possible threat. It's only been very recently that psychologists have begun to recognize the third response, freeze, in which we sort of go into shutdown mode before assessing what's the best course of action. The shutdown mode is why we sometimes see characters stand like a deer in headlights when danger is approaching. We scream, run, you idiot, at the screen to no avail. They're in freeze mode. They couldn't move even if they wanted to. So why do we respond differently? The answer is simple. Social conditioning. Each of us has varying lived experiences and relationships with certain situations. For a lot of us, the things that we find scary are conditioned, meaning that we associate a situation or a thing with negative experiences. And that association lives in our brains and our bodies. Body memory is your body's way of recalling what an experience felt like physiologically, rather than the actual memory recall of a specific situation. An example might be someone who watched Jaws as a child and is now afraid to go swimming. Seeing water might not immediately make their brain go, Big shark! Need big boat! Scary! But it may spark those similar physiological responses like a racing heartbeat, increased breathing because of your association with being afraid of jaws and the water. These things that scare us are perceived threats, meaning that our brains and bodies identify them as potentially dangerous, which will differ from each person. Despite our frontal lobe's capability to remind us, hey dummy, it's just a movie, Sometimes our amygdala does what's called an amygdala hijack, where our visceral emotional responses overtake any logic or reasoning. Our frontal lobe can tell us over and over again, oh my god, stop, it's just a movie. But our amygdala is going into overdrive screaming, don't care, I'm scared. And just like trying to calm someone down who's having a massive freakout, it doesn't matter what you do or say. They're at the mercy of their emotions, and they kind of need to write it out before they can even process what you're saying to them. Those who have experienced traumatic incidents in their lives will also respond to fear differently than those who haven't. For some, perceived threat levels skyrocket, and we become afraid of situations where no legitimate danger is present. For others, there is absolutely nothing in this world that can trigger a fear response as intense as something that we've already experienced, and scares in movies do little to impact our emotional state. And additionally, for some horror fans, the constant exposure over time can legitimately desensitize us to fear and strengthen our frontal lobes to prevent amygdala hijacking. The way these fear responses appear to the outside world also impacts how we handle sudden changes in our body. Things like audibly screaming, something that I am oh so guilty of doing, is your body's involuntary way of telling those around you, danger, scary thing, you should also be scared! However, because we're, we've for some reason made it socially unacceptable for people to have natural reactions to fear, even in a theater setting for a horror movie, we've developed ways to combat signaling to the rest of the world that we're scared. 
Laughter, for example, is one of the most popular ways that people respond to jump scares. Psychologists have three theories on why this is. Some believe that we laugh because we're signaling to those around us that we're having a good time and therefore not exposing ourselves as being vulnerable. I tend to believe more in the second theory and that we've developed a laugh response as a way to deny the fear that we're experiencing because society has deemed emotions like sadness or fear to be weak. The third theory is that our bodies just straight up don't like the energy exhaustion and emotional drainage of feeling scared, so we laugh just because it feels better. Jump scares in all actuality should be called jump startles, as these moments do not elicit a true fear response, but rather a jolt to the system that causes a sudden spike in these fight-flight-freeze responses. It's reactionary, but also quick. Whatever our usual response to fear looks like will greatly impact how our body processes the scare itself. And ironically, knowing the scare is coming doesn't actually help us. In most situations, it's actually worse because our bodies start the high alert process before the scare even hits, so when it does hit, it's a bigger high to come down from. It's why a random cat jump scare makes us jolt but immediately recover, and the goddamn anxiety-inducing lawnmower scene from Sinister will ruin your whole fucking life. The setup makes us anxious, and the anticipation becomes unbearable, which is also why bait-and-switch scares are so frustrating. It's like edging, but for fear. I can only speak from my own experience, but as someone with a highly active amygdala who overproduces adrenaline, films littered with jump scares are physically exhausting for my body. The constant complete change in body chemistry is too much for me to handle, which is also why I cannot play horror video games. The frequent spikes in adrenaline have been known to make me vomit. I'm also a person who has endured many traumatic events, and I cannot be trusted with my own physical reflexes to perceive physical danger. Meaning, I also don't go to haunted houses, because I have absolutely instinctively accidentally punched a worker whose only crime was being really good at their job. This doesn't mean that I'm too scared of haunted houses. It means that I recognize how my body responds to fear, and a haunted house is not a safe place for me to experience that emotion. I'm a liability. How our bodies respond to fear is not indicative of how tough or fearless we are, but rather a result of our lifetime exposures to fear and the way that we've learned to process those emotions. Are you the friend who screams and tries to crawl behind the couch? Awesome. Are you the immovable object who barely budges when a scare happens? Great. Are you somewhere in between? Just as rad. There is no right or wrong way to respond to a horror movie, and for the most part, we really don't have any control over how we react anyway. Luckily for us, the beauty of the horror genre is that those differing responses make for a more enjoyable communal movie-watching experience. Thank you, BJ. I feel so much smarter after listening to that, and I also feel so justified in my love of horror, as we all should. And now, we're going to take a short intermission. And we are back. And now we have the unrivaled Spider Queen herself, writer and host of You're Wrong About and co-host of You Are Good, who's going to share with us some poems of her own. So while I was working on an article called Violent Delights, which will be in The Believer very soon, I decided that I needed really to understand the progression of the 15 seasons of Criminal Minds from a relatively straightforward serial killer FBI procedural into a workplace drama taking place against a backdrop where every fifth person appears to be a serial killer. And once I had read through all the Wikipedia synopses, I felt like they were expressing something about culture more clearly than I really could in any other words. And so I made the slow effort poem. Season one, episode one, extreme aggressor. When a Seattle, Washington woman goes missing and authorities connect her disappearance with three unsolved murders, the FBI's behavioral analysis unit sets out to apprehend the killer and rescue his latest victim. Unit Chief Aaron Hochner is assigned to determine whether veteran profiler Jason Gideon, called out of medical leave for this case, is fit to return to duty permanently. Season 1, Episode 4, Plain Sight. When six San Diego, California women are raped, murdered, and posed with their eyes glued open, the BAU sets out to profile a killer who evades the authorities by striking in broad daylight and blending into the neighborhoods he targets. Season 1, Episode 15, Unfinished Business. A notorious Philadelphia, Pennsylvania serial killer seemingly resurfaces after an 18-year absence. 
but with differing methods and older victims and sends a taunting letter to retired FBI profiler Max Ryan. The BAU struggles to determine if this is a copycat or if the killer has resumed his killing spree. Season 1, Episode 22, The Fisher King, Part 1. When each individual BAU member receives a mysterious message while on bureau-mandated vacation, the team suspects they have become pawns in an elaborate fantasy game and sets out to identify a budding serial killer with a deadly fixation on Arthurian legend. Season 3, Episode 19, Tabula Rasa. When a suspected Roanoke, Virginia serial killer wakes up from a coma and insists he doesn't remember the crimes he committed four years earlier, the BAU relies on brain fingerprinting to determine if his claims are true. Season 4, Episode 8, Masterpiece. When a narcissistic psychopath, Jason Alexander, obsessed with the Fibonacci sequence, confesses to killing seven people and claims that five more will die, the BAU attempts to locate his latest victims before time runs out. Meanwhile, Todd struggles to deal with the fact that the team does not yet trust her. Season 7, Episode 2, Proof. When two Durant, Oklahoma women are sexually assaulted and blinded with sulfuric acid, the BAU searches for a killer determined to exact revenge against a face from the past. Meanwhile, JJ confronts Reed about his recent behavior and Rossi organizes a team cooking lesson. Season 7, Episode 20, The Company. When Morgan's older sister gets into a car accident while attempting to follow a woman who eerily resembles their presumed dead cousin Cindy, the BAU juggle reopening the case into her disappearance and tracking down a sexual sadist involved in a sadomasochistic ring. Season 9, Episode 18, Rabid. When three sets of human remains are excavated from a shallow grave outside Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the BAU attempts to track down a killer who infects his victims with rabies and films them as their symptoms worsen. Meanwhile, Garcia and Reed juggle preparing for an upcoming fitness test and keeping their plan secret from Morgan. Season 10, Episode 6, If the Shoe Fits. When two Missoula, Montana college students are stabbed to death, the BAU sets out to track down a female serial killer who believes she is an iconic fairy tale character. Season 11, Episode 10, Future Perfect. The BAU returns to Florida after two people are found dead in St. Augustine and find themselves profiling a killer who performs gruesome medical experiments on his victims in an attempt to find a cure for a mysterious disease. Meanwhile, Garcia grows stir-crazy as the search for the Hitman Network continues. Season 15, Episode 6, Date Night. When a father and daughter are kidnapped in Washington, D.C., Reed is forced into another confrontation with hit woman Kat Adams, Aubrey Plaza, which threatens his date plans with Maxine. Thank you, Sarah. That was a true journey, as it always is with you. Next up, we have Alex Steed, co-host of another of our most favorite podcasts, You Are Good, a show about movies and feelings. And he is going to share with us a little personal anecdote. Come on up, Alex. One time, I met horror rocker Jerry Only on a plane. Jerry is one of the founding members of the Misfits, still going at it. He's typically photographed wearing signature blacked out eyes to look like a demonic skeleton. His hair is fashioned in a devil's lock running like a foot long blade hanging from his scalp across his face. I'm always curious about how he's able to play the bass like that. But in this case, he was wearing a crisp misfit shirt tucked into sensible jeans. The shirt looked like it was plucked off of a Hot Topic wall in this case it was plucked i believe probably from a box of merch while on tour and uh he waited behind me to use the bathroom on this plane he was traveling for misfits related things i was traveling for work which was in video production and marketing and this was before the legendary horror punk band formerly led by fellow jersey short king and elvis and roy orbison devotee glenn danzig agreed to play a number of reunion shows i've heard that these reunion shows are a whole lot of fun and you know jerry had been holding his own in this band for decades he was one of the founding members as i said up top and uh he was playing with a rotating cast of characters keeping the spirit alive 
So I noticed the shirt first and I said, I like your shirt. And then I looked at his face and realized that this is Jerry only. And he lit up and he said, it's my band. And I said, I know. We exchanged pleasantries, but my turn came up. It was all over in a minute. He's a warm dude, like an uncle catching up on how you're doing at a family event. It's all coming out of this bruiser of a man with a very bright smile. This bruiser of a man who founded the band responsible for songs like Die, Die, My Darling and Mommy, Can I Go Out and Kill Tonight. And you know, there are plenty of bands that incorporate costumes and theatrics and dark fantasy into their lyrics. Plenty of bands that came before and then came after. But in appearance and vibe, the misfits themselves, they're Halloween personified. As far as I'm concerned, these are kids who are watching horror and sci-fi movies from the 50s on New York's movie station, Channel 11. And they were listening to Elvis and they were listening to Roy Orbison and punk was happening. And they were like, what if we just put it all together? They're like the villains or monsters from those movies of that era walked out of the television, picked up instruments and played together and didn't do the monster mash, but they did something in their vibe instead. So later on, we all get off the plane. And as I'm walking through the airport, I see Jerry and he waves and he says it was nice to meet me. And obviously I think that that's the last of it. And then I kid you not, I'm traveling again for work. Jerry's traveling again for work and we see each other again on a flight. I say hello, I reintroduce myself, and yet he recalls who I am. He recalled some details about my life. And after, he had a layover, and we sat together for a while, and we talked about life, and we talked about families, and we talked about the messiness of travel, and we exchanged information. And I assumed, of course, this had to be the last of it. This was already a wild coincidence. But months go by and then my phone rings and of course I look at my phone and see that I'm getting a call from Jerry only and we talk about the tedium of road life some more and we talk about what's going on in his life we talk about what's going on in my life and we talked for like 20 minutes and he asks if I'm free next month because upcoming is this barbecue which is an annual event in celebration of Guar, a tremendous thrash band that inhabits its own alien horror universe and mythology. They doubled down on the horror and theatrics of the Misfits and turned up the volume by about 100. But that year, founder and singer Dave Brockie had died, unfortunately, died quite young. And at the funeral, they'd be staging a symbolic Viking funeral for him. But I had recently started this video production and marketing company, and I couldn't possibly step away to go to the barbecue. And of course, that's one of the stupidest things I have ever done to not go to that barbecue. If you ever get presented with that opportunity, you obviously go to the barbecue. Obviously, you go to the barbecue when Jerry only asks what you're doing and if you'd be interested in going to the barbecue. But I mentioned the company and my work, and that piqued his interest, and we talked a bit about that. And he asked for some pointers about getting some press for his kid's school fundraiser, which itself was surreal, and we talked about that for quite a bit, and tactics, and how to go about those sorts of things. And we talked more about family, and then we signed off. And this happened again at least once more, and then we texted back and forth for a little bit. But it's been quite a while, and it was absolutely surreal, of course. And I can't quite put my finger on why, but it fits everything about my life and my interests perfectly. Halloween has always been my favorite holiday. Always. Ever since I was a kid, I really enjoyed the aesthetic, I enjoyed the horror, the theatrics, the presentation. And in retrospect, I realized I loved all of those things because it was a matter of playing with identity. I loved inhabiting not me for a little bit, but of course, you can't quite be not you even in costume. You're always you wherever you go. There you are. Even when you dress up, you're always just some extension of that even when you play around with these things. And meeting Jerry, this ripped short king demon from New Jersey who stepped out of Channel 11, the New York movie station, as a 50s horror villain to play in a band with his pals. Meeting him on that plane, that sweet kind of uncle-like dude. Uh, it's one of the many ways that I found this foundational truth to not just be a theory, but to be in actuality, one that I could eventually accept for myself. Thank you, Alex Steed. It is always a joy to experience your storytelling. I don't really know what this next poem is about, but it's called The Ring. 
Someone has been scribbling my heart so hard they broke the paper's skin. A shadow-eyed kid I thought I knew until he bloomed into silence and started to see things I couldn't. It starts like that. You find the papers on the floor beside his bed, the dark things you thought you kept a secret. Bright, false fool, your kid knows more than you. Your kid knows more than his teacher who places more drawings in your palms, her bracelets, false fluorescence, a cartoon you buried under a crayon house, an X for each I. When you finally do believe him, when the shrill phone rings and someone whispers on the other end, your kid looks up from his scribbling, from his carving of the circles. He smiles a little, looks back down, and when you hold the pen, you know what happens. And finally, We've got a little song that producer Miranda Zickler and I wrote together some years ago. Miranda is part of the band Coinka, and she resurrected this song with production by Riley Swedelius Smith. The lovely Carolyn Kendrick, producer of You're Wrong About and You Are Good, also provided beautiful harmonies and violin on the choruses. And you'll hear me singing along a little bit on the verses. It culminates in a cast sing-along. We hope that you like it, and we hope that eventually you'll sing along with us. Here it is. Tack up all your ghosts and skeletons Take the clouds of spider webs and stretch them thin. Take all your styrofoam graves and prop them up. They said, Here lies who you were, here lies who I was. Knock on my door, darling, tell me it's trick or treat. But I'll never trick you into loving me What I give to you I hope is sweet and safe My candy apple heart ain't got no razor blade Ghost. 
Thank you so much for joining us for this American Hysteria open mic. If you enjoyed this song, you can head to patreon.com slash American Hysteria to get a downloadable MP3. You can find out more about all of our esteemed guests in our show notes. From all of us, we hope you had a magical Halloween season. And just know that every day with listeners like you is a happy Halloween. Until next time, have a great night.